on introducing multi-tenancy to the DB2 world. My name is Paul Bird. I'm one of the senior architects in the DB2 development group. And uh, I'm here today to give you a little insight and view of what's coming soon to the DB2 world. And our agenda today is to learn about the tenant concept, which I'll discuss in a bit, and what's being introduced, uh, the capabilities that are first being delivered, and then to both give you some insight on what we're planning to do, as well as to begin to get your feedback on our plan. So uh, that's our agenda, let's get started. Because I'm talking about things that haven't yet shipped, uh, we have to cover the usual IBM caveats. Uh, obviously our plans and directions can change. Uh, if I mention any specific timing, that is subject to future considerations. So basically take this as a, uh, introduction to some capability that's coming soon and that we will be uh, hopefully delivering in the near future, but things can change. Some background. First, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, I will be using the term the DB2 Common SQL Engine, and it actually covers a, a whole family of products. Um, the code base, the DB2 code base that we all share, the DB2 Common SQL Engine, or, or CSE, is used by a number of different products. The ones you might be familiar with are obviously the original DB2, DB2 Warehouse, as well as DB2 Big SQL and DB2 Event Store. And those products themselves are often surfaced in other offerings from IBM, such as the Integrated Analytics System Appliance, the DB2 Warehouse on Cloud and DB2 on Cloud Managed Services and the DB2 Hosted uh, offering. So what I'm going to talk about today is a capability we're introducing into the Common SQL Engine and that will over time be introduced to all these products and be available in all these offerings. Another piece of background that's important to sort of cover before we get into this topic is uh, just remind us ourselves of the traditional configurations that are available to DB2 customers. Uh, obviously, there's a DB2 instance that you create and then you can create one or more databases underneath it. So uh, when you start talking about having more than one uh, user, one or more than one database, you can either choose to have a, a separate instance for each database, uh, as an example on the left, or you can choose to have multiple databases under the same instance, which is the many to one example. And this is, to date, this has been the way that most customers have dealt with the issue when they need to have more than one uh, set of users separated inside uh, DB2. They traditionally have created a separate physical database. Our topic today is about database multi-tenancy. And what is database multi-tenancy? It's the time when you have, want to have different sets of users in the same physical database. So you want to have a database that supports different groups of people where they all share the same infrastructure and resources, but each group or each tenant has their own private perspective of their own data. So they basically have their own privacy. The analogy I like to use when discussing this is, is that of an apartment building. We have all the different people who live in the apartment building. Each has their own apartment. They can choose whatever color they want to paint the walls. They can uh, you know, put the furniture however they like. They each have their own space inside the apartment building, but they all share the same uh, electricity, plumbing, the lobby, the elevators, they share common resources. So that's basically what database multi-tenancy is. And um, the other thing to remember is that because you share common resources and because you live in the same physical space, your actions can impact other people. So if you play loud music at three in the morning or you you know, depending on the thickness of the walls in the apartment, if you flush the toilet too loudly, these things can all affect your neighbors. So it's not that you're completely insulated and isolated, uh, but you are, you have a private space and you interact with people infrequently or only as you choose to. So that's the analogy I used to, um, I used to sort of describe database multi-tenancy. What we also have is the question of why would I even be interested? in multi-tenancy. So great, I understand what it is, but why would I be interested? And the number one reason is the cost savings. A lot of people are trying to consolidate and get reduce the number of physical databases that they have to deal with. Uh, this is the old one database versus many. So by reducing the number of databases, you reduce the amount of fixed overhead. Each physical database has a certain amount of cost associated with it just with, the, with its existence, whether it's um, licensing and, and physical resources. It could also be the cost of managing multiple disks, et cetera. So 
consolidation to one physical database often results in cost savings. So that's one reason. The other reason is the centralization or simplification of operations. Uh, right now you have someone uh, monitoring your database systems. They might be monitoring 100 or 200 databases. And that's a lot of different physical databases that they have to go visit each one in order to be able to monitor it. Or you have to have monitoring tools that can uh, themselves visit the individual databases. If you put that on so inside one database, you're now able to visit it from within a single database and you can use the monitoring available for that database. Another uh, reason why multi-tenancy has become of interest, at least from the customers I've discussed, is um, there are many cases where the development environments and the test environments that they have are much smaller than the actual production environment in which the applications they use run. So um, when they go to test to scale, they test as best they can in their system, uh, but the, it's not the same level of, of scale that they can get in their production systems. And uh, assuming they are able to get on their production system, then what they have to do is they, they can have um, opportunities to, to bring their application onto that system, but they have to be careful not to impact or collide with the, the current version of the application that's on the system. So they have to worry about naming collisions and, and overwriting user data. So they, they, they basically it becomes problematic to share these unique environments. So there is a desire to be able to do that without having to worry about those collisions. So database multi-tenancy is, is a, another way of, 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 of doing that. When might we be interested in database multi-tenancy? Well, obviously I've talked about multiple physical databases. So when you, uh, when you have multiple physical databases and you don't want them, there's so many of them, you'd like to reduce your physical uh, infrastructure. That's one reason you might be interested. Uh, another reason might be uh, you're consolidating and typically what people do when they're consolidating, they will flatten the application or flatten the, the database that's being consolidated. I'll, I'll describe that in the next slide. But basically they're collapsing the applications into independent schemas. Sometimes that's not possible or it's very expensive to go and rewrite your application in order for it to fit inside one schema. Um, another reason is that there are certain situations today where more than one physical database is not possible. So for example, right as at this moment, the uh, DB2 warehouse and IIS products only allow one physical database. And so there are cases when you want more than one physical database on, uh, on the, the device, but you can't get it. Uh, another example is that uh, the combination of SAP and DB2 PureScale, uh, when you put the two together, they're actually limited to one physical database per database instance. Just the, it's the collision between two different restrictions on the different products. But that's an example of, of things that exist today where it's not possible to have more than one physical database. And so if you want to consolidate onto that database but have the separation, you're interested in multi-tenancy. Here's an example of flattening where we have three different databases, uh, they're independent, and I want to bring them all together in the same physical database. Right now what I have to do is change the applications and change the, the user's behavior so that they live inside a single schema. I mean, you could think of the schema as being a, a set of schemas, but it's a restricted known set. So the green database goes to the green set of schemas, the blue database to the blue set of schemas. So you're flattening what used to be a three-dimensional world where they could have as many schemas and, and whatever type of environment they wanted in their database, you're flattening them to fit into a restricted set within the database. So the way, what I've described before about DB2 having the ability to have uh, multiple instances or multiple physical databases under one instance, that's been the way for almost 30 years now. And the question is, why, is it, why are we looking at database multi-tenancy now? As I mentioned, the biggest reason is there's, there can be significant cost savings for customers who have many small development systems who the physical overhead actually outweighs the, uh, the size of the, the database of the usage. So consolidating um, those databases would, would have tremendous direct and indirect savings of costs. Direct being obviously the physical machines and indirect being the operator uh, costs to manage those systems and the capacity and planning costs and all those other administration and management costs that come with multiple uh, databases. Another reason we're looking at is obviously we have our Natiza customers and um, some of those customers are looking to, to move off of the uh, sort of the Natiza framework onto the IIS or the other 
offerings in DB2. And, uh, but, but they have this concept called the CISA database, which is not so much a physical database as it is a, a, a multi-tenant solution inside the database. And they're unable or, or not, and unwilling to spend the effort to flatten their applications to fit into a set of schemas. So they want a, a solution that's much more natural, more aligned with what they do today. Similar with Postgres, uh, they have the same capability. Um, the two are tightly related. Um, so that's a situation where they want to be able to, to move to DB2, but they can't without a significant amount of effort. Uh, another reason, as I mentioned, is our is both our customer and IBM cloud offerings. It's a natural offshoot of cloud offerings to be able to say, I can host many, many people, and I don't need to have a physical database for each one of them. It's, it's a cloud, right? And it would be nice to be able to say, I'll host you all in the same physical database, but as far as you're concerned, it looks like you have your own world. Uh, it's, not, it's not a virtual database because obviously there's shared resources and what have you, but for the purposes of the applications that the users are developing or using, it, it, it appears almost like a virtual database. And then, of course, I mentioned the, the current limitation of one physical database in uh, DB2 Warehouse and IIS. So obviously, by uh, introducing a multi-tenancy, we give them more flexibility and the ability to do even more things with those products than they can today. So that's why we're looking at uh, multi-tenancy. What I'd like to talk about now is actually the whole, what we're doing about it. So here's our solution to uh, a database multi-tenancy in DB2. It's the DB2 tenant. DB2 tenant's a new database object, but it's also a, a plan. It's a series of capabilities that we plan to ship over the next little while um, as a series of deliveries to the common SQL engine, specifically to 11.5. And let me give you an overview of the grand plan. Uh, we, we're looking at it right now as a roadmap in the following way. We'll do something about namespace first, then we'll do authorization, and then we'll do something about cross-tenant query three-part name. What do I mean by namespace? It's, it's quite simply uh, the ability to have a, a set of definitions or each, each tenant to have their own catalog world. So we have here an example, we have a default tenant. This is what would come with the system. It's called system. Uh, these are all the catalogs and everything that uh, are created when you create a database. So you're, you're using it today. That's the system tenant. So you could come along and you could define tenant one and tenant two, and they each could have their own set of schemas and their own set of objects inside their world that could be different or the same in terms of name as the other objects in tenant two and in system, but there's no name collision. So they each have their own namespace. Right, that's about the, the naming of database objects. So they're able to have unique independent namespaces. From an authorization perspective, most of you are aware, you know, we have database level and object level and schema level has been available in DB2 Warehouse and uh, IIS for a while. It is coming to DB2 very soon, I promise you. Um, and when it, that's the schema level authorization. So what we're thinking of doing is injecting a new level, a new granularity of tenant, which would go across multiple schemas. And the tenant authorization plans are similar to this. This is the type of thing we've been looking at doing. And you'll see it's sort of a blend of database authorization and schema level authorizations, just at a higher level. So that's what we mean by authorization. And cross-tenant query, this is introducing the ability saying we have these different tenants with different objects, allowing them to reach out and query objects in other tenants, sort of like a, a, an internal federation, if you would. So tenant one can reach out and select from tenant two and be able to access the information there. Obviously all the privileges, et cetera, would have to be uh, respected, but the idea is that you'd be able to reference and reach out across out of your tenant into another tenant. So that's what cross-tenant query means. And that's our, that's our, so go back. So that's our roadmap. And that's what we're planning to do. What we've been working on and what we're going to be shipping in, in the near future is the first delivery of that namespace. So I thought I'd give you some details on what we're planning to do and what we're working on right now uh, for the DB2 tenant. Uh, as a reminder, so obviously, as I described, namespace is not everything we're doing for tenant, but it's the first thing we're doing. And our goals, our objectives for this first phase was to allow people to have their own independent catalog namespace from the schema level downward, so they could have multiple schemas, and inside those schemas, they could have multiple user-defined objects, and allow them to create and manipulate those objects and to insert and modify and access data in those objects 
everything that they do today, but in their own world, their own namespace. And then the other thing we wanted to do was make sure that they had a distinct authorization scope uh, so that if I have privileges in tenant one, I do not have privileges in tenant two. The, the two are independent authorizations. And so that you can manage your own security and your control within the tenant. So those, those were our, our objectives. The usage scenarios we were aiming at were, as you might guess, the consolidation of smaller test systems, being able to bring in multiple test systems into the same physical database and just put them in a different tenant. So that reduces your physical uh, footprint and simplifies your operations while maintaining the independence of the different test systems, uh, as well as uh, enabling that uh, unique environment scenario I discussed, so allow people to go and use their production hardware in off hours in a separate tenant without any risk or any access to the production data. So it allows you to do full scale testing of your development of your next version of your applications uh, without inter uh, colliding or, or, or touching the production data. The scope of the namespace delivery is the following. We're going to introduce the create and drop tenant DDL, the ability to set tenant. I'll describe some of these in a bit. Uh, a current tenant special register to tell you what tenant you're in. The set tenant lets you actually go to a tenant. Grant revoke the usage privilege. Tenant as a WM workload attribute. And then we've begun to introduce awareness of tenant into all a lot of a, a number of the key interfaces that exist. Uh, monitoring interfaces and tools. We haven't done all of them, but we've done most of them. So that's what's been going on in namespace delivery. What is the DB2 tenant? Well, as I mentioned, it's a new database object and logically situated between the database level and the schema objects. You create and drop it using create tenant and drop tenant DDL statements. And they're basically create tenant and give a name and that's how you create a tenant. You control access to a tenant using the new tenant usage privilege. So you grant and revoke that privilege, and in order to enter a tenant, you have to have usage privilege or be a DB atom. Each tenant is going to have their own set of catalog tables. Some of these catalog tables will be shared across all the tenants. These are typically the catalog tables that represent shared resources, such as table spaces, buffer pools. Those are shared database resources, but most of them will be private. So um, tables, routines, those are all private catalog tables. Each tenant has their own copy. They're not shared. They cannot access the other person's catalogs. DB2 defined objects. These are the objects that come when you create a database such as uh, sysproc, monget connection, those type of table functions. They're all defined, still defined. They're going to be shared across all tenants. They'll be available to all tenants. They're only going to be defined in the system tenant, but we've done some magic so that regardless of what tenant you're in, if you access a DB2 defined uh, object, you'll get to it, even though it's not in your catalogs. And then the user defined objects, as I mentioned, they'll be private within each tenant. So it sort of looks like this. We have, you create a database, you, uh, the set of catalogs you have are the same ones you, you, you see today. Everything looks the same as it does today. The one difference is we now call this the system tenant. So if you were to go uh, values current tenant, the new special register, you would see the value system be returned. And that would tell you that you're in the default set of catalogs. You cannot modify these, you cannot remove it. Uh, and this, this system tenant contains all the information for shared resources, as well as for DB2 defined objects. When you connect to a database, you get put in system. After that, a DB atom can come along and they can create a tenant, as many tenants as they like. In this case, I've created two, tenant one and tenant two. That's, that's how they're created. Once they're created, people can connect to the database. As I mentioned, they're initially associated with the system tenant. They can then issue the set tenant statement. So they can say set tenant, tenant one, and their connection will now be associated with tenant one, and they will now, any future SQL they issue will be executed in the catalogs, against the catalogs of tenant one. So that's how it's a, it's a two-step process. You connect, and then you set your association with the tenant. There are ways uh, that a client can sort of flow those two together. So you can flow the connect and with that comes with set tenant. Um, and obviously uh, I'll mention later about some roadmap considerations about how maybe to automatically do this. But because data, a tenant is an in database uh, concept, it's inside the database. Uh, outside the database, there's no awareness of the tenant. You connect to the physical database and once you're there, then you can go to the tenant. So that's the current uh, initial delivery. Here's a simple example of, of, of namespace. So I create a database, I connect to, to, the, to the database test. 
I then create a tenant world one. I grant usage on that world one to user one. And then I create a tenant called world two and I grant usage on that tenant to user two. So whenever you see blue, that's user one, world one. And whenever you see purple, that's world two, uh, user two. So now I'm going to show you uh, in parallel what happens. So user one connects to the database test, user two connects to the database test. User one says set current ten, tenant equals world one. And when they do a values current tenant, it shows that they're in world one. User two is going to actually use a, an alternate syntax, which is compatible with the SQL language, uh, SQL 92 language, set catalog world two. It's exactly the same. It's just a, we accept that as another way of saying set tenant. So set catalog world two. And when he does a values current tenant, he's in, oops, that's a mistake, that's a typo. He's in world two. So they're both in their own individual worlds. And now they go and create a table. In this case, they're going to create a table with the exact same name, mine.t1. But user one is going to create an integer column, and user two is going to create a character column. They're going to insert into that exact same name, and they're going to select from it. And the point there is that they're able to create identically named objects with totally different characteristics, and the interactions and the, the data in those objects is independent and is managed independently across each tenant. Looking at authorization, when we're talking about a multi-tenant world, first of all, the, all the existing database authorizations and object authorizations haven't changed. They still have the same scope. The main thing to keep in mind is that database, database level authorities apply across all tenants. So if you have a database level authority, no matter what tenant you're in, you have that authority. Whereas if you have an object level authority, you only have that authority while you're in the tenant where the object is defined. So authorization records for the individual objects are recorded in the catalogs for that tenant. So if you're in tenant one, you create a, um, a table and you grant select on that table. If you go to tenant two, nowhere in tenant two will you find that select. So in tenant one is the only place where that select information is recorded and that's where you have access to that object. Again, as I mentioned before, DB2 provided objects are defined in the system tenant. So if you want to grant execute on sysproc get connection to someone uh, out, you know, someone in your organization, you have to be in the system tenant in order to do that. The database role membership definition, this is one of the things that's shared. So because uh, users are defined outside of DB2 as our groups, they are implicitly shared across all the, the tenants in the database. And we made the decision that roles would be the same way. Roles are like in database groups. So roles like groups and users are across all tenants. They're defined in the um, system tenant. There's a shared catalog that contains the role definitions that all tenants can see, but all tenants share the same roles. From a uh, authorization perspective, this is what I've been talking about. That's all identical to what you see. The one thing that's new is we've added the usage uh, the access control usage. This determines whether or not you're allowed to use the tenant. Obviously, in the later parts of the roadmap I showed earlier, we would start filling in the uh, different levels of uh, privileges and authorities at the tenant level. But right now, we just have the usage privilege. So here's an example of auth authorization, just to give you an example of how things would work. I'm executing a query, I'm in tenant A, and my query, accesses both a, a locally defined table, myschema.t1, so this is something I defined, but it also accesses a, a DB2 defined object, sysprot.monget connection, which apparently is my favorite table function. So it's accessing both of those. When I go to check saying, am I allowed to select from myschema.t1, that authorization check is happening in tenant A. It's gonna consider the database authorities and assuming I don't have data access or something that would give me automatic access, it then will check the uh, table authorization catalogs within tenant A. For the monget connection uh, table function, it will check the database authorities again, but then if, it, if I don't have an access uh, capability there, it will check the routine auth categories, uh, sorry, catalog tables inside the system tenant. So the main point here is the authorization is checked in the tenant that owns the object or where the object is defined. So that's just an example of how authorization would work in the tenant world. Monitoring. So 
monitoring in the, in the tenant world is kind of an interesting uh, situation. We have, obviously, we have private data. We have objects that is personal. That's the whole point of the tenant. You know, I have my objects in my tenant. You can't see them. But we're sharing resources, and we're sharing uh, table spaces and WLAM, so that we're sharing things. So there, there are many cases where, from an operations perspective, I need to see across all the tenants. So for the first delivery, we've made the choice to do the following. We've decided that any output from the object-centric table functions, so a mon get table, uh, admin get tab info, they're going to restrict their output to just show you what's in tenant A. So if I issue in tenant A, I only see objects that are defined in tenant A. If I issue in tenant B, I see what's in tenant B, but not what's in tenant A. Whereas for all the other things, connections, transactions, uh, statements that are running, uh, lock weights, those type of sort of operational entities, they will return rows for all tenants. So if I say who's connected, no matter what tenant I'm in, I'm going to see all the connections on the database. So um, again, this is another area where we could use input in terms of what people are trying to do. But from a, a first step, we said objects are private, Resources are shared, so we need to be able, administrator needs to be able to see what's going on. Someone calls a problem in tenant C because someone in tenant A is, you know, launching thousands of statements. The, the administrator needs to be able to see that. So that, that's why we made this decision. And that's a, another interesting aspect of tenant. Privacy versus, you know, private versus public rights. Workload management. So I mentioned that we added the tenant as a new connection attribute for the workload uh, definition. So what this means is that if you say a workload is associated with tenant A, any connection that set, says set tenant tenant A will now automatically be eligible to be considered for mapping to that workload. And when it maps to that workload, if that workload happens to point to an independent service class, that's where the work will go. So basically, this would give you the ability, if you needed to control resources between two different tenants, you don't have to, but if you needed to, you could create a workload and create a separate service class for tenant A and manage it differently than tenant B. So that's basically a summary or an overview of what's in the first delivery, our namespace delivery. And obviously, if we were live, uh, there'd be a bunch of questions and you'd all be jumping up and down. So I apologize that we can't be uh, live, but we'll get an opportunity to talk later and I'll, I'll mention the time for that. But this, the other thing I wanted to mention about the NSA's delivery is a couple other interesting details about it. And I, I wanted to go over them because they're new and it's not specifically related to tenant, but they're, they're coming with tenant because of what tenant is driving. So obviously I'll answer the first question. When is it coming? When can we touch it? When can we play with it? We're working on it now. We've, we've been working on it for the last year. It's coming soon in 11.5, where 11.5.x, um, where X is greater than five and less than eight. So sometime in that time frame is what we're looking at. Um, if you look at the, the latest mod four release, you will start seeing tenant things popping out. It may not be called out, you may not see it, but occasionally you're going to see, if you select from your favorite table, table function, you might see ten, tenant name show up or something like that. So it is starting to pop up in the code base. Uh, they're all going to return system right now because we've, in, we've basically created the system tenant, but uh, if you want to do a values current tenant on mod four, you'll see system. So that's coming and it's being developed. Uh, we're going to stage the deployment of it to the family of products. And there's a reason for that, but let me just go into a little detail. Basically, we're going to surface tenant first in the DB2 warehouse uh, and a container in the products that use that, such as the IISI appliance, um, IAS appliance. The main reason for that is testing, is scope. That is a, a, a serial or an MPP environment. It doesn't deal with uh, HADR rolling up Date. It doesn't deal with pure scale. It doesn't deal. With, it doesn't deal with a number of things that we have to test and make sure work properly in um, in DB2. So once that testing is completed, then we will roll it out in DB2 deployment. There's no technical reason that, it, that, that there's no restrictions on this capability. It's available for all our customers. Uh, it's just a case of staging and testing. So because of that. Once we release in DB2 Warehouse, we might make it available for early testing through the EAP program in DB2. 
those details will be figured out as we move along. So if you're interested, feel free to ask, and uh, I'll let you know what the current state is. So that's one aspect. We're rolling it out in pieces, but that's not too exciting new. Here's the other thing. This is the really interesting thing. So first thing, we're shipping it as an up in a part of a modification pack, right? It's going to be an 11.5 modification pack. The other thing, the other fact is that Tenet requires a, a couple of new catalogs. Now we have the, the need for new catalogs inside a modification pack. So there is an actual new capability coming to DB2, which is the ability to deploy catalog changes within a DB2 modification pack. This is also going to be staged. So this will come with the namespace delivery. So it will come to DB2 warehouse first, and then it will come to the DB2 product. So it will be con done concurrently with namespace. Um, but I thought I'd spend, give you a little detail on that because that tends to get people's eyebrows uh, raised. So here's what we're looking at. So when you apply the 11.5X modification pack, the one that has the new catalog level in it, first thing you need to know is that if you have an 11.5 databases, they're not affected. Nothing happens to them. They are still on the old catalogs. If you create a new database under this 11.5X modification pack, you will get the new catalog levels. You'll get the new database level. If you upgrade a database from 10.5 to 11.5 using the 11.5x modification pack, you will get the latest database level. You will get the new catalogs. So that's the first thing to know. Existing is not affected, but anything new or upgraded will go to the new level. For existing databases, again, nothing changes when you apply the mod pack, all right? It's, it will run, everything is running on the existing uh, GA level of catalogs. You have to actually explicitly request saying, you know, I wish to update the catalogs. There's a procedure you call admin uh, update DB level. And that says, I wish to move to the new level of catalogs. When you say that, uh, what it does is the next time DB2 starts up, it will go and do some processing and add the new catalogs. And there's a little tiny bit of um, inserting into different row tables and so on. So there's a little bit of, it's like a mini upgrade, but it's, it's not an upgrade. It's a, it's a little bit of logic that has to happen to keep the catalogs in sync. Um, so that happens the next time the database comes up. So what you do is you request saying, please do the update. You bring DB2 down next time you can. You bring it back up. Sorry, you bring the database down and then you bring it back up. So DB2 can stay up. It's the database I'm talking about here. Um, and then what the next time that database comes up, this little uh, first connect logic, we call it, it will kick off and do the uh, updates to the catalogs at that time. The line in red there that I skipped over, basically once you're at the new level, you cannot go back to uh, mod four. So if you're on mod four and you go to mod five and you're trying on mod five and you say, this is, this is terrible. I hate you. I hope you don't say that, but if you say that and you want to fall back to mod four, you can. As soon as you say, please update the catalog level, you are explicitly giving up the ability to fall back to mod four. So the way it's going to work in the future is that um, each database, each DB2 new update will understand one or more catalog levels. As of 11.5 mod X, it will understand two catalog levels, the GA level and the new one. So if you have a database or a backup on either one of those levels, it can handle that. Well, mod four only understands the GA level. So we're going to come along, we're going to introduce this new level, and you try and go back, mod four doesn't understand it, neither does GA, so they're going to, you're going to get an error saying, I'm, you, know, you, you can't bring this database up under this level. So that's the, the first thing to know. It, it's, a, it's an optional choice, and once you step forward, you lose fallback. The main thing you'd notice is that uh, the GA level down here at the bottom, you'll see that the, uh, the GA value is uh, 0x1500, hex 1500, for GA, and when you add the new database level, it's hex 1501. So basically 1500, or the 15, the first two digits there, represent 11.5. And then what we'll be doing is if we add one or more catalog levels in the 11.5 code base, the second two digits will start incrementing upwards. So 01, 02, 03. Until such time as we have a, a new version, let's say 11.7, uh, then you would have 1600 representing 11.7, and you would, if we had catalog changes after that, 1601, 1602. So it's, 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 it will be explained in a lot more detail in the documentation, but the idea here is the key thing to take away, there are catalog changes, 
It's new, uh, new mechanism inside DB2. Nothing happens unless you ask for it. When you do uh, make the choice to move forward, an existing database forward to the new level, you cannot go back to the previous code base unless that previous code base uh, understands it. So in the future, um, mod pack X plus two, if you decide at that point to move forward to the new level, so obviously you could go to mod X plus, we're not forcing you to move forward, uh, but if you go forward in, in, in two mod packs after X, at that point you could go back to X or to X plus one because they understand the new level but you could not go back to mod four because it does not understand it. So that's basically the type of thing to think about. It's described in the documentation and obviously if you need more details, we'll provide it when we actually uh, deliver tenant. We'll have more you know, timelines and little examples. Anyways, that was a new thing that's coming with tenant. It's sort of tied with tenant because tenant requires it, but it is a new DB2 capability. We will be using it for non-tenant things. Any other catalog changes we need down the road, that's what we will be doing. Final words. So one thing I wanted to point out is here we have, you know, the original diagram I showed you where we had the one-to-one -one where the DB2 instance had a physical database, many-to-one -one where the DB2 instance had uh, multiple physical databases. Now we have a new many-to-one option available to us through tenant where one DB2 instance can have one physical DB2 database, but inside can have more than one tenant, more than one catalog namespace. So that's a new option that's available with tenant. The introduction of tenant lets you uh, it lets you look at a lower cost solution for hosting. It's obviously there's shared resources, isolation, insulation, you have to use workload management. So if you need complete isolation or complete control, you would look at one of the other configurations. But for many customers, for many, for example, many smaller test systems, this is a perfectly valid hosting option. And so it is a way, it's a lower cost option. So it's a way to move forward and uh, consolidate some smaller systems. It's definitely an easier path to testing on production uh, environments without disturbing the, the production code. You'd create a tenant on the uh, database and then you would uh, load up your test data into that tenant and you would run all your tests on that tenant. You wouldn't touch either the system or if you've created another tenant for production, you wouldn't touch the data in that tenant, the production tenant. Finally, um, I mentioned that some other platforms uh, actually have the requirement to uh, have multi-tenancy, so now it's easier for them and they won't be forced to flatten their applications if they want to move to DB2. They can just come as they are, when, uh, unless it makes sense for them to do it. If the application itself um, only uses one schema, well, they could just put it in a schema and not have to create a tenant. So it just gives you an option. Why else might you consider using tenant? Well. You could have your existing database and your workload management is very much based on the connections and who's coming in and the type of work. It's sort of, with the exception of data tags, it's mostly SQL or work oriented. It's, it's interested in what you're doing. But you may want to have the uh, case where you're saying, these tables, you know, I can't really define them that way, but I can define them by the type of objects being used. So you could create a tenant, put the objects in there, and then use the tenant as your way of saying, whoever accesses these objects is going to go over here to this workload and go into that uh, service cloud. So it's another way to, to look at controlling uh, your system through WLM, uh, independent of the multi-tenancy, just being able to subdivide the database up into different pieces based on the data object. Uh, another thought is that with tenant, again, if you don't care about the, the consolidation, you could say, I actually have two major users of my database and I want to be able to delegate some of the privileges and authorities to them. And right now, I, but I don't want to give them DVAtom Atom on the database. So the tenant, once we do the authorization piece, now you'll be able to say, well, I'll give you tenant Atom and do, give you a delegation of authorization across a subset of the database. So that's a new aspect that is, uh, might be of interest the further down we get on the, on the roadmap. So that's uh, basically what I want to talk about. I did mention there's a few other things we've considered and are not on the roadmap specifically, but have been thought about and have been sort of tucked away in our possibility files. Obviously, uh, once this comes out and we've had real feedback from you, the people that, that use our product um, through AHA or through individual feedback, that will really help. But we thought about uh, allowing 
cross-tenant references to objects like routines, being able to call functions from another tenant, being able to have someone uh, connect to the database, and instead of having to issue a set tenant, have the database sort of say, oh, uh, Paul, I recognize you. You have been defined as belonging to tenant one, so I will automatically switch you to tenant one. So Paul connects to test and is automatically in tenant one without issuing a set. Uh, being able to resolve objects across tenants by saying uh, SQL path right now, you give it a set of schemas and you say, we, if you give an unqualified object reference, we try and find a match based with that, that, that set of schemas. Well, what if some of those schemas were tenant dot schema? What if you were able to sort of say, it, it could be in that tenant, try that tenant for resolution. Uh, having user-defined global objects, having say, I'm gonna find a bunch of functions. I want it available to all tenants. These are sort of like enterprise functions. I want them available. Rather than defining them in each tenant, I wanted to find them in one place and have everyone find them. So there's, there's things like that that could be done. So I mention all these just because we're only at the beginning. We're getting out the basic namespace. We'll do the authorization. And at that point, it's your feedback and, and your guidance that will tell us what's of value to you in this world. So we are looking forward to that. But if you have early thoughts or, or scenarios where you say this would really be good if we had this capability, I'd be interested in hearing that because it's certainly the earlier we know it, the more we can take advantage of it and, and, and think about it. And that is the uh, end of the session. I would love to take any questions, but as you know, we're it's a one-way street right now. However, iDoug has very kindly set up a, a live Q&A session where you can ask your questions directly. It's only half an hour, but it's half an hour, so it's live. If, you have, if you're interested in this or if you have some questions, obviously you can uh, email me or contact me directly, but you can also attend the session on Friday, August 7th from 11.45 to 12.15. And I'll be there and we can discuss any questions you have at that time. Thank you very much for listening to me and to I hope you found it interesting and and that you're curious about getting your hands on it. So we'll talk again soon in the future. Thank you.